Okay, everyone, so welcome to day two of the binomial distribution. Um, today, I want to focus less on individually creating by hand all these distributions. We, we have technology to do that for us, and really focusing on what the distributions are, are showing us and telling us. Um, but before we do any of that, I want to take a step back and look at a few examples of different research, gambling, hypothetical scenarios and decide whether or not they are binomial and why or why not. So let's take a look at that now. Okay, y'all, let's look at some uh, different scenarios and see if they fit the bill for binomials. Remember, there are three requirements binomials have to have. Number one, each trial can only have two disjoint outcomes, only two. Number two is a fixed number of trials. And number three, it has to be reasonably believable that the trials do not affect each other, that each trial is independent of all other trials. So let's look at some examples. Let's roll a single die one time and count how many pips you get. Is that binomial? Okay, now if you go through your checklist, it fails the first point because there aren't just two outcomes. There are six outcomes. You can make it binomial, if possible, by simply rolling it once and keeping track if you got a three or not. Because now, two outcomes, you either did or you didn't. So if you count the number of threes, it's either going to be zero or one. It's a fixed number of trials because I said roll it one time. And there's no worry about probabilities affecting later trials because there's only one trial. Boom, that's a binomial. It's also kind of boring. Let's, let's take it a little bit further. Let's look at what happens if you roll a single die five times. What if you roll a single die five times and keep track of how many threes you get over those five times? Okay, so first off, does it match point one? Are there only two outcomes? Well, yeah, because you either get a three or you don't get a three. That's good. Are there a fixed number of trials? Hell yeah, because I said roll it five times. Do the probabilities affect each other trial to trial? Well, no, that's why we use dice. Well, I shouldn't say why we, that's why Vegas uses dice <laughs> and why they're actually a really nice thing to use in stats class too. Because whenever you roll a single die, there's a one in six chance you're gonna get a three and a five in a six chance you won't. So we can actually set this distribution up later in the Excel calculator, which we'll take a look at that as one of our examples. All right, let's keep going. Let's roll a single die until you get a three. How many trials did it take? So roll it, and then roll it again, and keep rolling until you get a three. Is that binomial? Now some of you might be looking at that and look at the last one and say, wait a minute, hang on, how is that any different? Well, I made it bold italicized, until you get a three. In other words, I have not specified the number of trials. I'm actually asking you how many trials it would take until you get a three. So that means we fail on the fixed number of trials. It doesn't matter that, yeah, there are two disjoint outcomes per, and the, since it's dice, they're independent because we failed on the fixed number of trials, so this thing is not binomial. Let's get away from dice. Dice are fun, but you know they're also pretty limited to Vegas and gambling. Let's move into research. All right, take a look at this one. We're gonna survey a thousand random people and measure their forehead temperatures, and then keep track of those in a chart. Is that binomial? Okay, hopefully you realize it's not because that data doesn't have a yes or no kind of characteristic to it. If you measure somebody's forehead temperature, it's continuous, not discrete, first of all. And there are basically an infinity of different values you could get for a forehead temperature. So this breaks the first rule of binomial. Actually, it breaks all of them because it doesn't involve probabilities, it involves measurements. So that one right there is definitely not binomial. It can be modeled most likely by a normal type distribution, which we'll get into uh, tomorrow, actually. That's when we start that. Let's move on. This starts the same, but look at the difference. Survey 1,000 random people and measure their forehead temperature. How many head temperatures above 99 degrees? Now, what do you think about this one? Is this binomial? Some of you might ask, Sean, it sounds exactly the same as the last one we did. Exactly the same. Except it doesn't, right? Because I forced this to be discrete. Sure, the data gotten is measured by some kind of precision machine, hopefully one that's up for the task. But once you do, 
each trial, when you stick a thermometer on somebody's forehead, each trial is going to either generate a yes, meaning their temperature was above 99 degrees, or no, meaning it wasn't. So going through the list of the binomial characteristics, number one, each trial, there's only two outcomes. Either they are above 99 degrees or they're not. Boom, number one. Number two, there's a set number of trials. I said survey a thousand random people. Boom. And number three, does each trial have any impact on the next trial? Now, if you're surveying random people, you wouldn't think that one person's forehead temperature would impact some other random person's forehead temperature. Maybe if they're in the same house, somebody that has a fever could infect somebody in that same house with a fever, but that's not random sampling. That's convenience sampling. So yeah, this, as it's phrased right here, I'm not sure how valuable it is, but it's definitely binomial. <laughs> Let's look at one more like this. Here we go. So hopefully you're realizing this one, just like the roll the die until you get a three, is not binomial because you have not fixed the number of trials when you've begun. All right, we'll look at some more of these in your homework. Uh, but what I want to do now in the next video is actually get, I'm going to do one more chicken example just to show you, um, I know chickens, are, you're probably sick of hearing me talk about chickens, but it, it's a nice gap bridger between something that seems a little bit silly, but mathematically is extraordinarily powerful. How we can use the binomial to do more research like this stuff we're talking about right here. All right, let's check it out.